Praise the Lord and welcome to the Church of Omaha, our online service tonight. God bless you. Thank you for tuning in. We're so glad you're here. And if you are not a, a uh, member of our church, we would love to have you come visit us in person and uh, be a part. If you are, thank you for seeing us online tonight. And of course, uh, we miss you when you're not here and we'd love to see you. So, amen. God bless you. Tonight, we're going to look at Proverbs 23. And I simply just want to title this timeless, in part because the book of Proverbs is timeless, the Bible is timeless, its principles transcend culture and uh, millennium and all of that, but <clears throat> you've probably undoubtedly heard such phrases as time waits for no one, or God is always right on time every time, or time is money, and each of these illustrate things about time and help us to navigate life. And Hopefully you're spending your time wisely and hopefully tonight we'll spend our time wisely together. So let's pray in Jesus' name. Lord, thank you for this opportunity to dive into your word, to look into it, to study it, and to apply it most importantly. I pray that you would guide my uh, thoughts and words that I would walk in your spirit and not in my flesh. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to walk with you, Lord, tonight. Hallelujah. Amen. I love walking in the Spirit of the Lord. I don't want to ever walk in my spirit, but in His. I don't want to apply my flesh. I want to do what He uh, says to do. So, timeless. Here we go. One of the Bible verses that intrigues me is when Jesus said in John 9, 4, I must work the works of Him that sent me while it is day. The night comes when no man can work. Jesus was God manifested in the flesh and thus was bound to time in that body. But as God, he was timeless. I'm comforted that God felt the pressure of a deadline, which helps me navigate my schedule when I feel overwhelmed. In the Bible, there are two words that help us understand the concept of time. One, and these are Greek words, so in the, particularly in the New Testament, but the, the first is chronos. It explains time that's governed by the clock. The other is kairos, which implies time that's governed by special moments. But the key is, is to understand that you can never return to either of them. You can't go back chronologically and redeem lost chronos time no more than you can go back and redeem lost kairos time you can only redeem the present and then make a difference going forward in the future well let's look at some timeless principles tonight from proverbs chapter 23 verses 1 through 3 6 through 9 and 20 through 21 all Talk about prideful lusts. Let me ask you a question. Have you ever gone to your favorite restaurant? I want you to think of that right now, your favorite restaurant. You ordered your favorite meal, and you cut into it. Maybe it's a steak, or you know, maybe it's a piece of chicken, or whatever. And you find that it's raw, or maybe it's overcooked, or maybe it's spoiled. It's been a long day. You're ready for a nice cool glass of milk when you get home you pour that milk into a cup and you're prepared to taste that calm soothing drink and once it hits your palate it's sour you spit it out of your mouth as fast as possible now i'm certainly not trying to make anybody sick tonight and if you're watching this and happen to be eating right now i do apologize uh, but these mental images help us to connect what these verses, again, verses 1 through 3, 6 through 9, and 20 through 21 are talking about. Let me, let me break them down further. Verses 1 through 3 specifically warn against being entrapped by a wealthy ruler to not be deceived by his hospitality or delicacies. He wants you to feel obligated to him to do his bidding, so he's going to feed you what you want and then he will make you think that you owe him because you have sat at and ate at his table. 
You see, this type of ruler is, uh, he has an ulterior motive. And it's attached to his gift. And if you're not careful, it will enslave you to his purpose. This is why we must be aware of the battle between the flesh and what the Holy Spirit wants. We need to be aware of the delicacies of the flesh because they are deceptive. To be, not be fooled by the flattery of those who would say one thing but then do another. Such people despise wise words. The broad way might look <laughs> uh, that, hey, there's a lot of people on it and it looks good. But it leads to destruction. Most are on that path, but that doesn't make it right. The delicacies they delight in are deceptive and will lead them to destruction. The narrow way may be lonely at times. It may not appeal to your five senses. It may even be rough in some places, but it leads to eternal life. It should make more sense then to follow the path that leads to eternity with Christ rather than destruction without Him. Verses 4 and 5, I, I really think sum up telling us to stop trying to be rich. Listen to what it says. Labor not to be rich. Cease from your own wisdom. Will you set your eyes upon that which is not? For riches certainly make themselves wings. They fly away as an eagle toward heaven. A lot of people work long hours, including overtime, to earn more money but miss those kairos moments, those special moments in life. Others employ human wisdom, attempting to get rich, but lose more than they thought possible. However, wise people know when to quit and how to invest in eternal treasures in heaven. A venture capitalist once noticed a young man successfully fishing to feed his family daily. Jose, the young fisherman, explained how he had learned the art and loved doing it. Inspired by the prospect of wealth, Don, the venture capitalist, offered Jose a deal to make millions of dollars and spoke of building boats and hiring and training more employees and extending their reach globally. Intrigued by Don's vision, Jose questioned and said, well, what would I do with all that money? Stunned a little, Don answered, well, you could retire and live the dream. And what is the dream, Jose asked. Well, to live any way you want to, Don retorted. Joe smiled and asked, and so if I wanted to retire and fish just enough each day to feed my family, I could do that every day with all this money? Somewhat frustrated, Don declared, well, of course, yes, you could do that every day if you wanted to. <laughs> Joe closed the deal as he replied, well, since I'm doing that already, I don't need to become rich. This short little parable I just told illustrates the lessons of Proverbs 23, 4, and 5. A, a global vision to start a company is fine, and there's nothing wrong with money. It's not money that's the root of evil. It's the love of money that is. But if attaining wealth is your only motivation, and you lose your family, and you lose your soul, and you have to compromise your values, and you have to go away from God, is it worth it? Jesus called a man a fool, not because he was wealthy and, and built bigger barns, not because he uh, had, had profited in this world, but he had failed to lay up treasure in heaven. Riches are fleeting. Like the eagle, they fly away. And all too often, the desire to earn more and protect what you have and maintain status consumes your time. So be wise. Set your sights on attaining treasure in heaven. If you remember from last week, we, we read a verse that I'm going to read again, which is very similar, verse 10. Uh, Remove not the old landmark and enter not into the fields of the fatherless, for their Redeemer is mighty. He shall plead their cause with you. This is verses 10 and 11 from Proverbs 23. God pleads the cause for those Greedy people who take advantage of others. God is the redeemer of the fatherless and defends them mightily. 
Reading such verses, I have to ask why anyone would cheat others, but especially those who have lost their husband or their father. I mean, why would you exploit a person's grief and death and sorrow to try to make money from or take money from them? Verse 12, let me read it to you. Apply thine heart unto instruction and thine ears to the words of knowledge. What a timeless principle this is. This uh, to cause to come in and bring in is what this word apply in verse 12 means. This definition indicates taking hold of something and carrying it inside. It's Solomon's not talking necessarily about bringing a book or research paper uh, from your car to your home. Uh, he's referring to both the heart and the ear. Explaining that you must get instruction into your spirit. You must open your ears and obey the words of knowledge. And you do, through, you do so through consistent and daily prayer, studying God's Word. Reading the Bible through, but also reading it thoroughly. Asking God to open your understanding so that you can comprehend His Word. And consistently praying and studying God's Word then enlightens, edifies, and empowers you to persevere. Verses 13 and 14, 19, 22, and 26 all uh, deal with correcting children. And I know I hit on this last week, but I want to bring it forth again. Let me read verse 13. Without, excuse me, withhold not correction from the child, for if you beat him with the rod, he shall not die. Verse 14, you shall beat him with the rod and shall deliver his soul from hell. And now it sounds like, oh my word, the Bible is for beating kids. No, no, let's not take it out of context. Verses 13 and 14 do support what's called corporal punishment or spanking a child, but it does not condone child abuse. Two or three swats on your children's rear end is sufficient to convey your point. And you should only use corporal punishment for severe rebellion against authority. Other forms of correction are just as effective in training your children. Taking away a privilege, you know, uh, not letting them do something that they wanted to do. Those are just as uh, painful, quote unquote, as a couple of swats on the rear end. You should seek the support of your pastor and other parents who have successfully raised children when you apply what these verses are really talking about. In verses 19, 22, and 26, it uses language that encourages sons and, of course, daughters to give their full attention to obediently listening to the wisdom of their parents. So any children that might be watching and listening to this right now, any teenagers watching or listening to this right now, remember that your parents were once children and they're doing the best they can Amen. It also explains in verse 26 how vital it is for parents to lead by example. Your children are great imitators, so give them something great and good to imitate. Your children will do as you do. If you want them to be kind, you have to practice kindness. Whatever you want them to do and be, you must do and be. The good news is this. When you bring your child home, that baby home from the hospital, they're like an empty computer without software. The bad news is that your actions become the software they download. And I say bad news because if we do bad, that's what the software is. That's what we put in. The good news, though, is that you can override some of that software through prayer, love, repentance, etc. Okay? Amen. By the way, let me just also say this. Don't ever be afraid to apologize to your children. You're not perfect. Your parents were not perfect. And guess what? They're not going to be perfect when they have children. So teach them the value of humility as well in your life. Verses 15 and 16, 23 and 25 
Talk about rejoicing for truth. Listen to this. My son, if your heart be wise, my heart shall rejoice, even mine. Yea, my reins shall rejoice when, my, when your lips speak right things. Verses 23 through 25. Buy the truth and sell it not. Also wisdom and instruction and understanding. The father of the righteous shall greatly rejoice, and he that begets a wise child shall have joy of him. Your father and your mother shall be glad, and she that bear you shall rejoice. I wholeheartedly agree with John and rejoice greatly that my children walk in truth. That's in 2 John chapter 4 and 3 John chapter 4, or verse 4, excuse me, not chapter. So 2 John 4 and 3 John 4. In Proverbs here, we see in verses 15, 16, 24, and 25, that Solomon uses the word rejoice four times, expressing that parents feel this great joy when their children are wise and say the right things and do the right things and become the right people. Such children have applied godly instruction and have avoided evil, and they're now going to pass on a legacy to their children. They've bought the truth. They have purchased wisdom and teaching and understanding and are refusing to sell it. And you might say, well, how do you buy those things? You buy it through diligent time, effort, prayer, and Bible study. You put in the effort to read it, to study it, to apply it, to pray it, to become it, to follow Jesus daily, to take up your cross, to deny yourself, as Luke 9, 23 says, and that's how you buy the truth and never sell it. Amen. In verses 20 and 21 and 29 through 35, uh, the great bulk of, of this uh, chapter, or a, a good portion of it rather, uh, deals with the bite of wine. If you've ever wanted scripture that talks about uh, how that alcohol is not a good thing, here is uh, some good scriptures. These verses play out every night in bars and in homes worldwide. People think they can drink away their sorrow and stop feeling the pressures of life. And while that alcohol may provide an escape momentarily, it also wrecks lives, destroys families, and leaves poverty and hopelessness in its wake. According to the National Center for Drug Abuse Statistics, alcohol abuse and alcoholism kill over 3 million people annually, accounting for 6% of global deaths. Every day, there are 385 deaths in the United States of America alone, resulting in from alcohol abuse, and you can see this from drugabusestatistics.org. So if you need help, please visit one of our churches. You can go to upci.org, and you can find a church nearby you. Of course, if you're in the Omaha area, we're here. There's some other great churches here uh, as well, and, and many of these churches offer some form of recovery groups or support groups. We have a trauma reboot group uh, our, our church up in Norfolk, they've had a recovery group before. I don't know if they're still doing it now, uh, but these groups help people and they, they support people in getting through and over such addictions. Amen. God wants to provide you with something better than the bite of wine. He wants to fill you with His Spirit compared to new wine, Acts 2, 1 through 4. Amen. So you can overcome it. You can overcome any addiction. You can overcome any sin through Jesus Christ. Amen. Verses 26 through 28 um, deal with avoiding immorality. And again, what a timeless principle these words are. Uh, let me read them to you here. My son, give me your heart and let your eyes observe my ways. For a whore is a deep ditch and a strange woman is a narrow pit. She also lies in wait as for a prey, and increases the transgressions among men. The world parades immorality like it's a joke. Sin takes center stage in many arenas and conference floors day after day worldwide. So please don't fall for the lie of sexual perversion. In my 30 plus years of marriage, 31 and a few uh, more uh, weeks here, amen. Uh, um, you know, I, I will celebrate 31 
years of marriage, and I've read many books, and they all support the fact that those in a monogamous relationship between one man and one woman experience sexual pleasure more frequently and more enjoyably. It's, it's, it's fact. It's Bible. God designed marriage as such. So if you're single, please keep yourself pure for your spouse. Invest your time wisely so you can enjoy a lifetime of love when you enter the covenant of marriage. So let me ask you, how are you spending your time? We're not timeless yet. We will be when we're raptured and glorified in, in the uh, first resurrection. But how are you spending your time? Did you know that every one of us, regardless of our economic status, every one of us has the same amount of time every day? God gives us 1,440 minutes every day, allowing us to choose how to spend them. When people tell me they don't have time, I kind of snicker a little bit because we all have time. What they're really saying is, I don't want to spend what I do have on that. And I'm not saying it to be rude. It's just a fact. There are times when my bandwidth has reached its limit. I can't take your call now, but maybe I can take it later. I understand that. But when people say, I don't have time to help clean the church, or I don't have time, uh, you know, it's hard for me to pray. I don't have time to read my Bible. No, it's not that you don't have the time. It's that you're not spending the time. Those who seem to get more done other than those who don't, it's not that they have more time. No one receives rollover minutes. Unfortunately, it's not like AT&T. You don't, well, I only used, you know, 1,400, so I've got 40 minutes left I can roll over tomorrow. You can't do that. It doesn't work that way. So the question is, how will you invest your time? What will you purchase with the currency of time? John Owens said this, Satan's greatest success is making people think they have plenty of time before they die to consider their eternal welfare. Don't make the mistake John Owens is talking about there. Make sure that you've spent your time wisely here when you're bound to time so that you're timeless with Jesus and not timeless in the lake of fire with Satan. Let's pray. Jesus, sometimes your word grips at our hearts, convicts us, and speaks directly to who we are, hitting the bullseye. In such moments, thank you for convicting us. Thank you for the love that you have to rebuke and correct us so that we can make a change now while we have a chance so that we can repent and spend eternity with you, Lord. I pray for each and every person listening, applying, and giving their hearts to the word that you would bless them tonight in Jesus' mighty name. God bless you, love you, look forward to seeing you. We'll get back next week and we'll look at Proverbs 24.